Welcome back to another episode of the Nonprofit Show, everyone. I'm joined today by the amazing Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy. Welcome back, my friend. Well, thank you so much, Julia. Happy Friday. I, I hope you and other folks enjoyed an extended weekend and uh, earlier this week and uh, have survived cramming a full week into just four days. So that's always kind of what happens with those, uh, those three-day holidays. You know, it's so funny that we would choose to do a topic on wellness for fundraisers and fundraising because I got a witness to you. Sometimes I feel like that day off just creates like two days more of work and stress. I mean, I have to work tomorrow a full day, which will be Saturday. It's, and this is not a boo-hoo thing. It's just that I couldn't get my work done and then it messes up my whole team and it's it's really a, an interesting thing to, to reach the end of the week and be like, what the heck? I need more time. And so this is going to be a good conversation because I've got to believe that a lot of people are thinking this way. Oh, for sure. And I think now more than ever, these conversations are being embraced and valued. Mm -hmm. And folks are, and I say folks, employers, employees, yeah. uh, are, are willing to look at ways to invest in our wellness, both yeah. body and mind, as as you you know, as we say in the title. Yeah, I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. And I was thinking about this, getting prepared for this episode. You know, we talk about this for the sector at large, but I think a lot of times it's oriented towards programming folks and those teams that are you know face to face with clients we don't talk about this enough with our fundraisers and then we wonder why they're burned out and they're leaving and so i think this is something that really we need to be uh to use the word more mindful of uh, because it's just such an important thing another thing i want to be mindful of is our 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 sponsors and they include bloomerang american nonprofit academy staffing boutique nonprofit thought leader fundraisers friday and your part-time controller. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, joined today by the amazing Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy. He's one of our fabulous cohort of uh, co-panelists, and uh, we really pull him in on Fridays to have these conversations. So let's get to it, Tony, and start off with the integration of wellness into corporate culture and fundraising I'm not sure that we've done this. Yeah, well, certainly more organizations, you know, there are more organizations having this conversation, like I said, than, than ever before. And I think the, the magnitude of investment really depends on the size of the organization a lot of times. Uh, but I, I'm hoping that throughout the course of our conversation today, uh, folks that are, are viewing the show or listening via the podcast, uh, We'll get to understand that there are ways to lean into wellness that don't cost a lot of money and don't have a negative impact on your your bottom line, so to speak. But but it does start at the top, uh, and it yeah. is something that is super important when you talk about culture. Uh, one is the culture for us to be able to, without hesitation, have these conversations around mental health or or physical health. Uh, then a, a culture of resolution, right? It's one thing to, to have leadership that, that are willing to hear uh, and engage in these conversations, but it's another thing to have leadership that wants to engage in resolution and solutions uh, to, to some of these, these challenges that fundraisers, uh, and as you said, program folks, anyone in the nonprofit space, yeah. anyone in any space <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. is, is dealing with. So, uh, so you know, corporate culture is, is super important in terms of, again, creating the space for conversation, creating the space for folks to engage in activities that will support uh, their well-being. Uh, and then around fundraising, we could have a whole show, Julia, around how do you put the fun in fundraising, right? So yeah. there are a lot of ways, really, and to put the fun in fundraising. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked a little bit about this last week when we were talking about kind of getting ready for your annual performance yes. appraisal or review. Yes. Uh, part of the way we put fun into fundraising is celebrating all of the small successes along the way uh, before we get to those big wins. 
Uh, but I've done a lot already. But yes, wellness in, in the corporate culture and, and having that uh, start at the top is is super important uh, mm -hmm. in terms of team members uh, feeling comfortable around uh, conversations on this topic. Do you feel, Tony, that it's more um, evident during Q4, the end of the year, uh, the end of the calendar year, moving into the holidays, holiday giving, all of those stresses? Do you see that this is more of an issue at this time of year um, than maybe other times of the year? Um, because in some ways, I feel like we're having this conversation too late. But then in other ways, I feel like this conversation is the timing is perfect because we, we will see a little bit more duress on our team members uh, or with our team members. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I like what you're saying there. I, there, there are many organizations that that operate outside of a calendar fiscal year, so yeah. not everyone's kind of having that end of year anxiety in, in terms of of meeting goal. Uh, but what I would say is that folks that I know, everyone I've ever met that is in this nonprofit space is so passionate about the work that they do and about the organizations that they're serving. So mm -hmm. there is an initial anxiety that just comes al along <laughs> with yeah. that intense commitment uh, to doing good. So yeah. whether we were having this conversation today, which is great, or whether we had it six months ago or four months down the road, it's going to be relevant, I feel, regardless of the time of year. Mm -hmm. My guess is there was anxiety thinking about creating whatever the end of year programming or gift you know, yeah. ask was going to look like. Then there's the anxiety around when it kicks off and is happening. And then there's the anxiety around kind of what do the final results look like. Uh, but then hopefully there's that space for a lot of celebration, uh, yeah. either at the end of that or, again, the small steps along the way uh, that, yeah. that gets you to those those big wins. So I, 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 don't, I don't know that that this this investment or feeling this investment in wellness or feeling of anxiety is exclusive to a certain time of year. Right. And that's that's my takeaway from your comment is that this it's not healthy to think that this is just temporal and that it's assigned to a certain quarter. Because I think, you know, we, we have that expression, the straw that broke the camel's back. It's not this piece of straw. It's all the things that led up to it. Right. And so I think you're right. I think you're very wise in that to say, look, we don't want to get to our team or even have this conversation when everybody's fritzed out and we're starting to lose people. That's just not efficient. We want to be navigating this conversation, you know, through and through in a, in a more intelligent and, and strategic way. And we talk about this across the management specter of nonprofits. You know, we don't just say, oh, okay, it's Q4, get out there and fundraise. No, I mean, we have a, you know, um, a, a continuum of care, a continuum of process. And so very, very interesting. Well, let's talk about getting and finding support in within this sector um, we have, you know, two of our uh, fundraising professional organizations, Association of Fundraising Professionals and CFRE, Certified Funding, Certified Fundraising Executives. They split the word fundraising. Um, you know, I wonder, Tony, and my question to you is like, is the is this when you're a fundraiser? Are these the people that you need to be talking to about this within the sector? Because are the folks within your organization that might not really understand what it means to be a professional fundraiser, mm -hmm. are they going to be able to give you peer support? Or do we need to look outside to other fundraising professionals? Yeah, I think that that's a, a really good question. I don't think there's a one size fits all solution when we talk about our anxieties and, and the things that trigger our anxiety or, you know, or our, our stressors. I certainly agree that folks that are kind of living in the same space day after day will have a deeper uh, insight into some of what you may be feeling uh, if, in fact, your anxiety is really driven by some of the work, uh, the way in which you're doing the work, uh, some of the obstacles uh, that, that you may be confronted with. So yes, I think organizations like AFP 
and connecting with other folks that are in the same space, mm -hmm. uh, you will certainly get a deeper insight uh, if, if that anxiety and some of the stressors around your wellness are job related. Um, but I think there are many other avenues, you know, as, as well uh, to take a look at. And, and some of what I wanted to talk about, because when we think about physical wellness or mental wellness, it's how do we create those wellness opportunities for our team members, again, without compromising our our bottom line. And I say compromising, just meaning that for yeah. a lot of organizations, there just usually isn't a line item uh, for these types of investments. Although we can definitely attest to uh, the huge ROI that, <laughs> that you get when you do invest in the physical and mental well-being you know, of your team members. But there are, there are mindfulness trainings that are available free, you know, on YouTube. So if, if that's something that, you know, you want to engage in, uh, there are apps that you can download. There's, I'm not affiliated with them, but there's one called Swerkit, S-W-O-R-K-I-T. So Swerkit.com, they have an app. So there's exercise routines on there. Uh, there's mindfulness meditation opportunities on that app. So there's just lots of ways for folks to engage in what's right for them. Not yeah. everyone wants to be in a group setting to, right. to have these conversations. A lot of folks want to do this, you know, on their own and in their own personal space. Yeah. I love that you brought that up because I think that's a really um, important aspect, especially since we have this work from anywhere um, environment and culture that's really picking up steam. Um, and especially with fundraisers, you know, a lot of fundraisers are not always in the office, right? They're out and about and they're meeting with their donors and, and traveling. And so this is kind of one of those um, aspects of understanding that how we can make the fit work um, and what works for one, you know, person might not work for another, but yet we still need to get there, right? Um, and we still need to be of, of service to that. Before we go on to the next um, question, I know that you recently joined the board of your AFP um, in, in Central, is, would you call it Central Florida? It's actually the Broward County, Fort Lauderdale chapter. Okay. okay. So as a board member and as somebody who's seeing, you know, the, the ecosystem of, of uh, professional fundraisers across the spectrum, are you all talking about this? Oh, with, well, without a doubt. I mean, yeah. one one thing that that we're doing, and and a lot of chapters do this, and and this is kind of our our annual or biannual opportunity. We're sending out a survey right now uh, oh. to our current members and some of our lapsed members around programming, and and wellness is certainly one of the you know topics within that survey. Mm -hmm. So we can get a good understanding of what folks are looking for and what their expectation is of our chapter in terms of helping to meet uh, their needs when it comes to wellness, again, whether that be mental or, or physical wellness. So we, we are definitely having that conversation and, and looking to our members to tell us what it is that they're looking for uh, so that we can add that value to their, their membership. Yeah, it's really interesting. I can't wait to hear what the results are and, and maybe we need to squeeze that into one of these episodes um, when, when it's, when the the um, answers are revealed or the surveys revealed because again i can see whereby professional fundraisers are going to be you know within their profession and their sector able to talk about certain things that maybe they wouldn't share with or not share but relate to with people in the finance department or programming or facilities management i don't know i mean maybe not maybe it's all maybe it's all the same, but it'll be very interesting to see what uh, and to learn from what some of these responses are, because I would imagine, Tony, they're not being asked by their own organizations. Yeah. I mean, we, we started off talking about culture and how it needs to start, you know, kind of at the top. So it uh, that really kind of drives, drives everything uh, in, you know, in terms of how anyone, regardless of their role within the organization uh, is embracing uh, you know, wellness. What's interesting too, Julia, I think are, about 
the survey that I mentioned and wellness being a component of that is that the conversation initially started off around programming and professional development for our members. Uh-huh. And, and it's, it's exciting to see uh, and, and be part of advocating for wellness to be considered part of professional development. Uh, yes. So it's not a standalone. It's not something that kind of sits isolated from all of the other training and professional development uh, that we invest in, either as leaders of an organization or invest in ourselves individually. It, it sits very nicely within and, and under the umbrella of professional development. Okay, that's like a hair and fire moment for me because I'm I haven't had that conversation with anybody. Um, it seems like it's been separate add-on, almost like a perk and something to keep your employee retention high, as opposed to seeing this as professional development. I am super intrigued by that. I think that makes it easier to sell too, um, to you know your finance team, to your board, and also to your team. Yeah, and, and I don't have it in front of me, and, and I can't quote it, Julia, but I'm, I'm sure that there is is data that supports, right, you know, just kind of the outcomes of these types of investments in, in wellness. And, and I don't think that, you know, if, uh, if we think of ourselves just as human beings, I don't think you need a whole lot of data to say that the better we feel yeah. <laughs> about ourselves, uh, the better we're going to perform. Uh, for the organizations and communities that we care about. Right, right. Well, I think we need to be um, we need to be speaking that truth too, right? We need to be saying when we look at employee retention um, as which is such a crisis. It's such a crisis in American business, for profit and nonprofit, but especially in nonprofit. Um, you know, we, we, a lot of times I think boil it down to, well, we just don't have enough money to pay folks as opposed to looking at some of these things like today's discussion and saying, well, this is a value add. It's not going to replace money, but it might help to build a stronger relationship with our teams and therefore happier employees, more productive employees, employees that stay. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a part, dare I say, an economic discussion. Oh, with, yeah, with, without a doubt. We, we all know the cost associated with having to fill a position uh, with yeah. someone when someone of value and talent leaves the organization. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and again, without a doubt, I don't think you need data <laughs> to, to prove it, uh, that when we provide opportunities for folks to feel really good about themselves, whether that's through mental health or physical health or nutrition, uh, yeah. you know that often is, is part. When we talk about physical health, we also talk about nutrition. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think you need data to, to to help you believe or understand that that just makes a, a, a better organization and a more successful and and healthier workplace. Right. Well, and you said something really interesting when we first started. Um, off, you know, it's a tone at the top issue when you have leadership that can identify this, or maybe not identify, but articulate it and say, this is the path of leadership. This is the path that we're going to take and support. Um, I think that we have employees that don't hear that. I mean, I can say that I didn't say that to my teams very often, especially when I managed um, a lot larger team. Um, we didn't have these discussions. If somebody was having a rough time, we isolated them and and kind of gave them support to, you know, deal with things on their own versus looking at this as a part of our culture, which I think is a fascinating rework of of uh, labor relations and and just general workplace vibe, if you will. Not that that's yeah. like a you know, that's not an official word, but you know what I'm saying. I, I do. I think it's important also to mention that we often say fundraising is a team sport. Mm-hmm. Well, wellness within an organizational culture is also a team mm-hmm. sport. So mm-hmm. even though we talk about uh, it needing to start at the top, the ownership of its success does not solely reside within senior leadership. So everyone needs to be engaged in wellness 
within their organizational culture. Everyone needs to take ownership of a piece of ensuring that everyone across their team feels valued and relevant and has the tools that they need, whether it be for them to, to engage on their own or with others uh, to manage some of these, these mental health and, and physical health um, challenges. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, before we move on to the next um, topic about how do you do this, we've talked a lot about how do you manifest this. I'm going to ask you like kind of an off the cuff question, but when we talk about fundraisers to me in my mind, I think of like higher education as like the, the top level, the most, you know, successful fundraisers in our country. And that, and maybe the hospital system, you know, they are like the gold standard. They get the big bucks. They have really interesting programs that navigate these oftentimes large teams. And then you filter across 1.8 million nonprofits in our country. And then you come upon somebody that like, let's say they work in the shelter services or domestic violence uh, shelter services where they're dealing with gritty elements that our work environment is often unsafe. It's very stressful. It's very traumatic. Um, and I'm wondering if you see a degree or a correlation between these types, the spectrum of what you serve in the nonprofit world to wellness, um, because it doesn't seem like we talk about it. We talk about it generally, but we don't necessarily say, look, these are the people that need the help. These are the people that we just, we need to be watching. Yeah. I, I think the irony in your example is that there are often nonprofit organizations that have these services for the clients that they serve, yes. but don't have them internally for the employees that are yes. serving, you know, this, that particular community. So, uh, yes. so there's a lot of irony in, in that, you know, in that example. Uh, Again, I, I think it's, I think it's very individual. Uh, I don't think it matters whether you're working for a large institution or a grassroots organization where you're kind of, you know, seeing the folks every day yeah. uh, that you're serving and, and trying to have a positive impact on. Uh, because stressors, you know, again, they just vary by individual. True. Uh, so, so I. I don't know. Again, there's probably data that would support one or the other. Uh, the way that you framed it, it seems natural that you would lean that one is probably more stressful and, and would have some of these needs more than another. But it's just so individual. And, and so I don't want to minimize anyone's feels <laughs> because that's how they're feeling, right? Uh, regardless of, of what their job title might be uh, within a particular organization. It's an interesting question, though. You know what? You're a nicer person than me. <laughs> so that that if, if we need if we needed an example, you're just a much nicer person than me. Because I'm like, you work at a museum, really? Go down to the shelter and then tell me how you feel. I mean, that's kind of my. I'm the mean woman. So yeah, yeah. But think of the pressure of that that programming officer at the museum that just got in. That just got in this. 10,000 year old relic to put in their museum and the stress around making sure that thing doesn't end up a pile of dust while it's under your care. So I mean, it again, <laughs> you're right. Again, Tony Bell is the better, the better person here. Well, as we finish up today, um, let's talk about the pursuit of wellness and what it can be. You mentioned this over and over in our, our conversation today that this doesn't have to be a budget buster. These can be things that um, are available, whether it's individual or group. You said something really interesting in the um, uh, in the green room, and I'm going to call it out. You know, you made the comment about over the week, the Labor Day weekend, and finding time to cook, and then you know, expressing your love and gratitude with food and cooking and stuff like that. Um, so I think it's kind of an interesting thing is that it, it is not a one size fits all, is it? No, no, it's not. And I think the first kind of step for any leader or anyone that wants to 
move forward with wellness initiatives within their organization is to survey your team members and get a good understanding of what it is that they feel like would be meaningful and impactful. Uh, some folks, again, would, would be quite happy, you know, watching a YouTube video around meditation or mindfulness. Uh, others might want to do a group yoga, uh, you know, in person or even online. I mean, we've done, uh, you know, I've done group yoga online. So, uh, you know, so there, there's all of those opportunities. But first, you know, before you invest even your time, uh, survey, you know, the first step would be to survey your team members, one, to just understand the level of interest, uh, and then to get a, a good understanding of what types of activities they're looking for. But there's lots of things that you can do uh, that, that, again, aren't, aren't going to break the bank or, or have any kind of, of big impact on your budget, but will have a big impact on your team, how they feel, and ultimately the way that they perform in support of your mission. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so interesting, Tony, I was thinking about this um, in preparation of, of working with you today. You know, back in the day, it was like, what do you mean we don't think about wellness? We we bring in free donuts on, you know, Mondays or, or we have like Friday, you know, McDonald's day, not to beat up on McDonald's. But do you know what I'm saying? It's like we used to do, you know, pretty ridiculous things and think, what do you mean? We're thinking about labor, right? Versus like going to the next level, pair people. Yeah, no, I mean, it's funny, but you McDonald's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm reflecting, I mean, you know, decades again, but, you know, like when, when it, there would be like, you know, the green milkshakes for St. Patrick's Day at McDonald's and you'd go and buy like 20 green milkshakes and take them to the office. Yes. So, exactly. yeah, so I, yeah, so I, yeah. I, I understand, but, but folks, you know, I, I think that there's a, a, a greater need in today's environment and, and workforce uh, and deeper conversations and solutions uh, that, that need to be realized for, for folks that are, are working in this space. But uh, I don't know. I don't know too many people that say no to a milkshake, but uh, but we still need probably a, a little deeper or a French fry. <laughs> or a French fry. <laughs> or the French fry in the milkshake. Um, yeah, I think you're right. And I think that um, one of my big lessons today that I learned from you, which I learn from you every day, but um, I think that concept, and I've heard you say this before, but it, it is that survey aspect. You know, you are you think you identify something, you think that you have a solution, um, and and maybe you don't, right? Maybe you're just part way there. So by by surveying your group informally or formally and really saying, you know, what does it look like to be successful with this? Um, I think it's really the right place to go. And it can can be done quickly and efficiently. And then from there, you can be more strategic um, with some low cost things or possibly not, maybe investing more, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah amazing. Well, Mr. Tony Bell, you are a, an, an incredible thing. Um, last but not least, we want to end with this, this uh, message. And it's really asking for help. You know, you the, the thing that we need to, to do when we're assessing a, our situation, our teams, is asking for help. And I think that's really a powerful way to um, to end because we don't ask for help, do we? No, 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 we don't. And, and again, it goes back to the very first slide, Julie. It's around creating this culture within our organization where it is so easy for someone to ask for help without fear of judgment uh, yeah. or, you know, or any of the things that might come along, come along with that. So yes, it's, it's the first step for anyone and, and all of us yeah. is, is feeling empowered uh, and comfortable enough uh, with who we are to, to make that ask for help. Right. Well, those are wise words, my friend. I really appreciate it. Um, again, we are here and I want to express our appreciation um, we're here because we have these amazing sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, which is today, our new episode on Fridays, and your part-time controller. These are the folks that are part of our wellness, if you will, because they allow us to march towards our 1,200 episodes, and now we are in our fifth year of broadcasting. So um, again, yeah, I know, I know. 
it's crazy, um, but but fun. And so these are the folks that really, like I said, they're part of our wellness here. And so we want to say thank you. Thank you. All right. Mr. Tony Bell, I hope you have a fabulous and wellness oriented weekend. I'm wishing you the same. I'm going to go get a milkshake as soon as we're done. I'm telling you, uh, you said that. And then I was like, oh, those Wendy's Frosties. <laughs> That's well, we sick. have a Dairy Queen right around the corner, so I, I might hit the Dairy Queen. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Well, it was 116 yesterday in Phoenix, and uh, I think we all, the city deserves a giant uh, Frosty. So. Without a doubt. <laughs> all right, everybody. Well, hey, it's talking about wellness, nutrition better be our next conversation because I think we just tanked this whole episode by talking about milk, milkshakes. But we want to end with this message, and it goes like this to stay well so you can do well. Thanks everyone. See you again.